Oh, it's been brought or brung. I'm going to do my best. Well, I guess it'll help if I can get this open first. Man, what an amazing service so far, right? You, you know, there are things that happen in service that are just awesome, and then there are things that happen in service that are awesome. And, and I can't tell you, you know, to hear uh, Linda and Mo share with that vulnerability. Yes. You know, it's, it's never fake, the holding back the tears. But when you're at that point and you're laying your heart out there in such a way, I, I don't know, maybe it's my, my four daughters have made me soft and weak, but it's hard for me not to cry. Uh, so many good things happening in this service. Uh, one of the best things for you guys is I only have like 30 minutes to preach, <laughs> uh, but it has been an amazing day so far. So tomorrow is a mystery and today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. That's uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, right? Uh, Roosevelt. And that's simple, but it's really profound. Of course, tomorrow is a mystery. Only God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. But we have to plan. You got to get up for work. You have things going on this week. We have to plan things that are going to be coming up for us. We've talked about midweek and regions and special missions and all these other things that are going on. These are things that we have to plan. Right, we can't just sit back with our feet up on the coffee table eating bonbons, binge watching, binge watching Netflix or something else, and then say, okay, God, make it all possible. We got to be out doing and moving. Right? You can't give direction to a parked car. Right? So look at Proverbs 16.9. Proverbs 16.9. In their hearts, human plans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. We plan, but we have to be willing to let God take the, the wheel. God, give us the direction and move us in the way that we're supposed to go. So today is the gift. You know, we woke up on this side of the grass today. Amen. Did you thank God for that? Did you think, what was your first conscious thought when you woke up today? What was the first thing that you know for sure you were awake and you were thinking? Was it, thank you God that I'm alive? Was it praise Jesus? Was it, man, let me just snooze. Let me just snooze one more time. Was it my back hurts? Was it my neck hurts? Ah, oh, man, I have to do this today. Ah, uh, what was the first thing going through your mind? You know, we talk about familiarity breeds contempt, and we often think of that in context of relationships. Uh, we begin to take for granted the people that we see every day, the people that we see frequently, and it's just one of those things, oh, we couldn't get together, no big deal. I didn't get to see you today, no big deal. I'll catch you tomorrow. Yeah. And we start not truly appreciating those moments that we have. We start getting easily frustrated, angered, we're insulted when something doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, how dare you? You know, but if you saw that person once a year, would you be so easily insulted and upset? Would things bother you so much? Or would you just be thankful that I get this time and this moment to be together? You know, we're losing sight sometimes of the honor and privilege of being in relationships. How about our life, though? Have we become so familiar with our life that we're contemptuous? We're no longer thanking God that we woke up. We're no longer thanking God for the blessings of life. Through the years in my practice, I have asked people many, many times to tell me 10 blessings in 10 seconds. I want you to tell me 10 blessings in your life in 10 seconds. And it's amazing how many people can't do it. How many people can be like, ah, oh, one, two, three. Well, uh, let me see, uh, my life, um, oh, my husband, my wife, my children, they just struggle because we get into this, this idea, this concept that a blessing must be this grand, amazing, it's just huge. Those are the blessings in life. And we're missing it because everything is a blessing in life. You know, if you think about it, you could easily say, 10 blessings in your life as quickly as you can. 10 seconds, right? Well, man, I slept in a bed. I have clean clothes. I can take a shower. I had a roof over my head, right? My bed sheets were, were clean. Uh, I have breakfast on the table. I have a job that I'm going to. I have friends, family. I, everything becomes a blessing. My job, my car, on and on and on. It all comes down to your perspective. How do you want to see everything in your life? 
If everything is not a blessing in your life, it's because you're looking at it wrong. When is the last time, when is the last time you were running late? Yeah, I'm going to let that marinate a minute. When was the last time you were running late? All right, you're running late and you get stopped at a red light. When's the last time you said, thank you, God, for this red light? (laughs) Think about that. Think about that. I'm late. I'm rushing. I'm frantic. Ah, the red light. You know what, God? Thank you. Thank you for this ride. For whatever reason, maybe you spared me from an accident. Maybe this, maybe that. Maybe it's time for me to sit and think, maybe I shouldn't have snoozed. Who knows? Whatever it is, are you taking those opportunities to really be thankful for God? You know, every red light in life, every storm, every challenge, every persecution, every difficulty, every enemy, your coworkers, your, everything that is difficult for you is a blessing if you're allowed to be. Every time your coworker wants to interrupt, every time, every time you open your phone and there's 50 messages that you got to respond to, and man, I'm telling you, we got a lot of communication going on at church and... Uh, I'm going to gloss over that one because that could be a sermon series in itself. But, you know, everything that we have is a blessing. And we look at some of these smaller things, but what about bigger things? What if today you were diagnosed with cancer? What if today you're battling an illness that the doctors can't even diagnose? What if today you're battling a lifelong chronic condition? You know, we... Mo said it, the persevering faith. We should thank God. She said, James, thank God for trials of every kind because it's through those things that our perseverance is built. It's those things that make us mature and complete. You know, I think of Josie and Chaz and Chris. Yes, come on. You know, Chris isn't here today. Um, I'm pretty sure he's probably online, but he's not here with us right now. And it's because he had a really bad day that led to a really bad night, that led to a bad morning, and a message saying, I can't do it. You know, Chaz's struggle, Josie in recovery, you know what I've never heard from them? I've never heard complaining. I've never heard grumbling, moaning, poor me. I'm not saying that there's not bad moments for them or bad moments for us in life, but they have maintained an upbeat, positive, glorify God perspective and attitude in everything they do. It's, it's a perspective that honors God, and it's a perspective that's an example for all of us. You know, but there are more situations than, than we know that are going on in this room right now. You know, Mo shared, uh, you know, there are people right now struggling just to find work that will sustain them. There are people losing cars. There are people living in cars. There are people struggling to eat. There are struggles happening right now in this body that many of us don't even know. You know, life is real. The challenges are real. Persecution is real. The enemy is real. And these things are happening right now. You know, Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, what does that mean? You're going to have trouble, but hey, take heart. I overcame everything. And, you know, what does that really mean? Is that just some glossy little thing? Like, I don't really know. So I'm going to, you're in a bad situation. I'm going to go to the greeting card store, and I'm going to go to the section under, I don't know what to say. Take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. You know, it means that nothing in your life is happening in a way that God hasn't caused or allowed No matter where you are in this moment, God has caused it or allowed it. God's not up in heaven freaking out. Oh, I didn't get the report. I don't know how that happened. What can I do now? God's not wringing his hands and and worry. Everything is happening because that's the way it's supposed to happen. If you'll fix your eyes on things above, like Colossians 3, 1 says, if we will fix our eyes on things above, then perhaps we can start to have a perspective like God. Perhaps we can have a perspective that God wants us to have. I have said to my daughters through the years, and anytime I'm going to talk about my daughters, I'm going to tell you first, I'm never going to win Father of the Year. Uh, I, I speak kind of plain, probably not as well as I should have, but I've said to my daughters through the years that any idiot can see what's wrong. Anybody can look at a situation and see everything that's wrong with it. 
But can you take the time to look deeper into that situation that's falling apart, that seems like this is the end? Can you look in that moment and find the blessing, find the beauty? It means that we praise God in our victory and we praise God in our defeat. It means we praise God in the rainbows and in the storms. We praise God in the beauty and we praise God in the ugly, which means that we need to praise God now. Today's sermon title is, Now is the Time. Point number one, sound your trumpets now. So as you're turning in your Bibles to Joshua 6, I would say that we need to take stock of ourselves and see how do we handle adversity? How do we handle adversity? When things are, I mean, well, first of all, if you, if you ever met somebody who's like always on, they're always positive, they're always upbeat, nothing ever bothers them, amen, brother, amen, sister. Uh, those people make me nervous, all right? Because it, it just can't be that way all the time. We're gonna have moments. Those announcements, those things, they're going, life is gonna punch you in the mouth. And, and when your tooth is dangling and your mouth is bleeding, in that moment, you might not be able to say, praise Jesus. But what you're looking for is the pattern. What is the pattern of your life? We're all going to need encouragement. We all need those close and uh, uh, relationships. But how do you face adversity as a pattern? Joshua 6, beginning at verse 1. Come on. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. First one, the gates and the walls. No one went in, no one went out. Walls and gates have their purpose. They protect and they fortify but they should only protect and fortify what's worthy of protecting because not everything in life is worthy of protecting. Not everything in life deserves a fight. Not everything in life is a hill that you should die on. What I mean by that is, are we building walls around the wrong things in our lives? Because when we build the wall around the wrong thing in our life, no one goes in and no one goes out. What we actually become is a prisoner within our own walls. We become hostages to those things if we build them around the things that don't matter. You know, Nehemiah went and he built the walls around the temple, around the city to protect the temple. We need to guard our heart as our temple. We need those boundaries and those protections. We need to maintain our inner sanctuary, but we need to be careful not to build up the walls around the things like that person wronged me. That person hurt me. This situation scared me. So instead of confronting and deal with it, we build this wall to protect. Not a bad thing. Keep those things out that hurt us. But we do it in such a way that we don't resolve anything. And that wall makes us a prisoner to that moment in the past. Yes. It makes us slaves. It makes us hostages to moments and people. And that's not the way life is supposed to be. And you're never going to live life. You'll never experience life. You'll certainly never experience the goodness that God has planned for you hidden behind your walls. If you look at verse 2, I have delivered. Just as God delivered Jericho, God wants to deliver you. God wants to deliver you. Whatever your situation is, whatever your struggle, your battle, your moment right now, God wants to deliver you. All right? Now, if Chris was here, I would say, don't worry, Chris, this is not a prosperity message. And he would probably say, oh, good. Because this is not one of those like, you know, hey, come down to the front and we're all going to pray and you're going to be delivered. It's not that. It's not saying if you give a certain amount of money, you're going to be blessed in this way. This is, this is not that. Right? Go ahead, Sony. You can say it for Chris. Oh, good. Oh, good. Right. What this is, is understanding that God has a plan for you. That's not a generic you. That's you, you, you. Every one of us, God has a specific plan for us. And it's a plan to give you hope and a future, a plan to bless you, not to harm you. Now, does that mean that life is going to be all sunshine and roses? Oh, absolutely not. You know what? 
Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And while you're going there, I will go there as well. The Bible reads, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. And that is life. We are going to endure all of these things. There's, you are not going to live a life and not encounter hardship. You're not going to live life and, and, and somehow escape someone that doesn't like you, someone that doesn't persecute you, a job that doesn't cause you to struggle, yeah. uh, sin, temptation. It's there and it will come against you, but we need to rest in the confidence of who we are in Christ because we are going to encounter these things, but they are not failing moments. They are not defining moments. They are on our way to the journey. Jesus said, I came to give you life and give it to you in the full. He didn't say I've come to give you life and help you build your wall so that you can hide back and shrink back and live in despair. I didn't come so that you can isolate yourself. I've come that you can live life. And the only way that you can do that is by living life, which means getting out from behind those walls. We are all either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or there's a storm on the horizon. It's there. The storms of life, they're coming. But God's plan is to grow you in the storm. His plan is to grow you in the storm. The storm is there so that you can grow. The storm is there to help you develop perseverance. Let that perseverance become your character. Let that character become your hope because hope does not disappoint. You know, that hope in the Bible is El Pizzo. And what it means is it's an expectation. This hope that we have, uh, what Mo read in Hebrews 1, this hope is a confidence. It's not just I hope one day. It is I know. I am confident that this is going to happen. And when you're standing on the promises of God and you're standing on the words of God, your hope is an expectation. It should be an expectation. So that sounds great. But what does it look like? Well, first, go back and look at the story in Jer uh, uh, walking around Jericho. What achieved the victory? What achieved the victory? It wasn't the army. It wasn't their strength. It was their faith and their praise. Their faith and their praise. Look at verse 10. Verse 10, you'll see something even deeper. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word. Until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. Don't say a word. They marched around in silence for days. How huge is that? Yeah. Not even like, man, I can't believe we're walking around the city another time. I mean, don't say a word. You know why? Because somebody would have been mumbling and complaining, grumbling and mumbling. There we go. All right, let's walk around the city one more time. Maybe what we need to do is learn from that and understand that the power of life and death is in the tongue and those who know how to use it will enjoy the fruit thereof. In other words, what you're speaking is the fruit that you're going to eat in your life. So if your life is a little bit bitter right now, you need to look at the fruit that you're producing from your mouth. You know, God spoke everything into existence. He didn't think it. There's power in our words. Your faith is demonstrated by what you speak. The Greek word, I, I thought you were going to nail this for me. I was like, man, I should just give you my sermon notes as I come home. The Greek word for faith is pistis, and it starts by saying it is a constant profession. Your faith is spoken. Yes, it's demonstrated in the way that you live, but it's seen in the words that you speak. What are you speaking? You know, if you're negative, if you're down in the mouth, if you're Sally Sadsack and Johnny Raincloud all the time, I just don't think that's going to work. Oh, I can't. Oh, it's never enough. It's too much. I won't. No, you know what? Guess what? You're right. You're right. All of those things are true for you because according to your faith, let that be done into you, unto you. So if that's what you profess, amen. Get ready to receive the abundance of your faith because you're giving power to your faith through the words you have professed. So in your storms and your challenges, what are you speaking? Are you in your battle talking about how God is awesome? Are you talking about how good God is in that moment? Are you speaking about faith and trust and your hope? Are you speaking that God is the God of the impossible? 
or God is the God of the impossible, that you can do all things through Christ that gives you strength. What are you giving power to in the words of your faith? For some of us, uh, it may be time, that it's, time to learn that it's never too late to give up an opportunity to be quiet. Some of us just need to learn to be quiet. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't ask for help. That doesn't mean that you don't get open. That doesn't mean that you suffer alone, you suffer in silence, that you're never vulnerable. Don't be fake. We can't all be up and on all the time. Life is happening. But if you are down and negative as a pattern, then something is wrong. Something is wrong. And I'm going to submit to you that it's your focus. It's your focus. I lift my eyes up into the heavens. Where does my help come from? God, where's your focus? It doesn't say, I have cast my eyes around me and figure out what I need to do. I lift my eyes up into the heavens. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on God. Fix your eyes on the word and the truth and the hope and the faith and the promise. That's where your eyes need to be fixed. You need to speak your faith. Because you have a choice in every moment. You can either praise God or you can curse your circumstances. But you cannot do both at the same time. You can't do both at the same time. What is coming out of your mouth? Are you speaking the faith that makes God proud? Are you speaking the faith that continues to bring the circumstances that you're living in? You know, in life, if you don't like what you have and you don't like what you do, then change what you say. It was the trumpets of praise. It was the shout of praise that brought the walls of Jericho down. We need to let our shouts of praise bring down those walls around us, the walls of our circumstance, the walls that we are hiding behind. We need to quit telling God how big our giants are. We need to quit telling God how bad our situation is. We need to quit telling God what we need. We need to quit telling ourselves and everybody around us that'll listen to how bad life is, how bad this moment is. You know, another way I've said it to my daughters is if you walk outside barefoot and you step in a dog bomb, it's gross, it stinks, it's squished up between your toes, it's nasty, it's not fair, it's the neighbor's stupid dog. You've got two choices. You can spend the rest of your life saying to everybody, look, 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 can you believe, can you believe this? Look, look at what I'm standing in. Or you start washing your foot. Some of us need to start washing our feet. <laughs> we, we need to start thanking God. It happens. We need to start thanking God. Because the challenge of the storm, it is meant to grow you. Everything in life, good or bad, everything, everything we encounter is God's stepping stone for us to the next level. If we will endure. Because if you choose not to endure then this is where you end, standing and complaining about the dog bomb. We need to praise God, and we need to praise God now. Point number two, your only season is now. Your only season is now. Everybody knows Nike, just do it, right? Nike, just do it, all right? If you're in real estate, then you've heard location, location, location. Even if you're not in real estate, you've probably heard location, 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 right? If you're investing, then timing is everything, right? Timing is everything. You ever heard uh, the, the, the concept of market penetration? Whenever a new product is introduced to the market, if you graph it out on a, on a, a curve, uh, an S curve, however long it takes for that product to reach 10% market penetration, in other words, 10% of the population is using it, it is the same amount of time to go to 90%. Wow. You can do cars, radios, um, TV, the internet, all of these things, it, it graphs out whatever that wave is, 10%, same amount of time is 90. So if you're an investor, when's the perfect time to invest? 10%. All the work has been done. The, now, now we're just taking off on that wave. But you know what you can never look and say and see? The 
You can only look backwards and see the 10%. You can't pick that exact moment. And life is the same way. We have opportunities in life. And often we miss those opportunities. Why? Well, we're overthinking. We're overanalyzing. We're worried. We're not trusting God. We're trying to do all of these things. Sometimes we miss the opportunities in life because they come disguised as work. (laughs) We miss opportunities because uh, I don't really want to do that. That's uncomfortable for me. This is not really what I like or what I want right now. And so we step back and we miss a huge blessing in our life because it came disguised as work. When we're not willing to go the extra mile, to be made uncomfortable. Do you know how busy I am? I don't know if I could really do that right now. You know, life is not a spectator sport. You better be in the game. And it has been said that when we die, the only regrets we will have are the chances, the opportunities that we did not take, the things that we missed. We need to strive to not be that day going, man, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have taken the time to do that. I wish I would have taken the time to spend with that person when they were with me. I wish I would have taken the time to go and do that extra thing for my brother or sister. I wish I would have taken the opportunity to give that person the ride even though it was miserable and it wasn't in my, the same direction I was going. I wish that I would have done more to support the kingdom. I wish I would have done more to support my brothers and sisters. I wish I would have done more to evangelize the world in this generation. Don't wake up one day because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Don't wake up one day in the judgment seat going, man, I wish, I wish, I wish. Turn in your Bibles to Mark. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, we're beginning at verse 12. The Bible reads, The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. You know, you might say, "Mm, Jesus, are you all right? I mean, is this the first time in recorded history we're witnessing hangry? You know, after all, it didn't say he, he ate breakfast. Was he just like, man, I wanted a fig and curse you tree because I can curse you? You know, Jesus, weren't you a little rough on the fig tree? Right? And his disciples heard him. I mean, there's a little fig tree out of season. I mean, no one ever going to eat fruit from you again. No, he said it. May no one ever eat from you again. It wasn't an accident the disciples heard. It was calculated. Just as calculated as what happened next. Look at verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. You know, we know from John's account that Jesus saw what was going on. He left. He made a whip and then went back in. This wasn't Jesus went in and got angry because he still hasn't had any fig. Uh, He didn't go in angry and out of control. It was a calculated, measured response to what he saw. Jesus taking a stand, righteous indignation, not anger, righteous indignation, not some wimpy savior, not some guy afraid of confrontation, someone bold and stepping up and saying, "Uh uh-uh, this is not how it's going to be in my father's house. There was strength and there was power. He wouldn't let anyone carry merchandise across the temple court. Stopped everyone. And he preached all day. This wasn't a single moment. After he did this, he stood there and he preached all day, morning to evening. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? We grumble and complain. Oh, man. Got 30 minutes to church? 45 minutes? Oh, man. Really? And all we're doing is showing up and participating. He preached all day. Man. Wasn't his job. He just wanted to spread the good news. 
You know, of course, the Pharisees hated him. They were plotting to kill him all along. This is nothing new. You know, if, if just quick side note, if you go back and look at the things that are happening, if when they first started to investigate Jesus, if they would have investigated openly and honestly, they would have seen the recorded miracles are what the Jews would have known. This is going to indicate the Messiah. They weren't interested in the truth. They were interested in maintaining their, their power and their status quo. They wanted him out of the way because he was getting in their way. Look at verse 19. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. And in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. The tree was withered. It wasn't wilted because it hadn't rained. It wasn't just drooping and sagging a little bit. It was wilted from the roots. It was dead. Dead. Never coming back. So we'd say again, all right, Jesus, that was a little harsh. The fig tree shouldn't even have had figs on it. It wasn't the season. It wasn't the time. No one in their right mind would have gone to the fig tree and expected to get a fig tree from it. So what is Jesus saying? If you're only doing the minimum, it's not enough. Jesus is saying, if you only produce fruit when you're expected to produce fruit, I'm not impressed. I'm not impressed. If you only do the minimum, if you only do what's expected when you think it's expected because now you've decided it's your season, I'm not impressed. We get this idea that we should be prepared in season and out of season because that's what the word says. But what it creates is this idea that, well, it's not my season, but you've asked, so I'm going to go ahead and produce. No. If we need to be ready in season, that's season. If we need to be ready out of season, it's still season. There's one season. Your season is your life. That's it. I don't care if you're young, you're middle-aged, you're advanced. You got one season, one life, and that's it. Amen. You know, we get asked to do something. Can you serve? Can you step up? Can you do this? Oh, sorry, it's not my season. Maybe next season will be my season. Sorry, I'm, I'm really busy right now. You, uh, listen, you have no idea. Hey, did I, did I show you what I'm standing in? Well, if, you, if you understood this, you wouldn't even ask me right now because you would understand. We need to stop making excuses for what we can't do. We need to stop blaming it that I don't have time, I don't have the experience, I don't have this, I don't have whatever it is. But if, if God is calling you to it, then he's going to qualify you for it. If we want to look at the truth of being in season, it's about bearing fruit. That's it. At the end of the day, are we bearing fruit? Now, we can look at that in a lot of different ways if we wanted to. Fruit of the Spirit. Uh, you know, maybe I'm doing great in patience, but I'm not doing great in kindness. Maybe vice versa. We need to be bearing fruit all the way around, not just where we think we should or I struggle here, but don't look how good I am over here. We need to bear fruit all the way around. We need to understand that each of us have different skill sets, different attributes, different abilities, and appreciate that. Uh, if we were all the same, we'd be in a lot of trouble. We need the diversity. Yes. Amen. If all any of us could do is sing, who would preach? Amen. If all any of us could do is preach, who would run the media team? Come on. Right? If all any of us could do is run the media stuff, where would the ushers be? Each of us have talents. Each of us, we have abilities. We have things that we like. You know, if we're all ushers, who's going to handle the administrative responsibilities? Thank you, Marie. Every, yes, thank you, Marie. Every one of us has things that we like to do and come naturally to us. So why aren't we doing it? It's not so much what can't you do. It's what are you willing to do? Amen. What are you willing to do? And why are we waiting to be asked? Nobody here is going to be forced, compelled, coerced. We're not going to beg. But nobody should have to. Where's your heart? Why don't you want to? Every one of us should be asking, how can I serve? You know, I've said it in the South region, it's easy to sit back in a service like this of 100 people and let 20 people do the whole service. But when you go to a region and now you're a church of 35 and 20 of you need to lead the church, if that doesn't kind of wake you up, we need to get Mo's sister from Tampa to come slap some faith into you. <laughs> Right? Because it takes every one of us. There's always room on the worship team. 
There's always room in the media team. There's always room for another usher. There's always room for somebody who has a heart and a willingness to give more, to serve more from your time, your treasure, and your talent. It's time to stop waiting to be asked and start asking, how can I serve? What can I do? Stop making excuses. And the ultimate bearing fruit is making disciples. That's the ultimate bearing fruit. Helping people come to a knowledge of the truth. Helping people come to salvation. That is bearing fruit. But are you doing your part? Everybody according to your ability. Are you in studies? I'm not even asking if you're leading studies, but are you in studies? Are you even sharing your faith? Are you even talking to people? You know, we talk about evangelizing the world in this generation, but are we even doing our best to evangelize Orlando? Sounds great. Evangelize the world in this generation. What are we doing in our backyards? What are we doing in our hometown? You know, if we believe the things that we profess, then we have to know that we have the best gift in the world and we can help somebody receive the same gift. And if we're not helping people come to that same thing, we either don't believe what we say we believe or I don't even know how to explain it. How do you explain that? I have access to the best thing that you'll, you could ever have in your life. I ain't going to tell you about it. I'm not going to let you know I have it. You know, we need to be sharing with everybody, and I mean everybody. We need to be thinking Orlando, but we also need to be thinking in the world. Well, how are every one of us going to go everywhere in the world and talk to everybody in the nations, and we can't? But it's just like Sonia said, we do it through special missions. You know, I know we have spoken about this a lot over the last couple weeks, but we didn't talk about it for the first few months. We hardly mention it. We have today and next Sunday to do our part to reach the portion that we've been asked to do. All right? Now, will we hit it? I don't know. I think we're still $45,000 short. I don't know if we'll hit it. Do I believe that we can? Yes. I absolutely believe we can. You know, last year, I forget, I think we were like $9,000 short in the last day. And I I had most faith. I was like, this ain't going to happen. We're going to come up short. And we went over by what, 2,000? Yeah. Right? So God can do what God can do with the little that we have. Will you give your two fish and your five loaves? You don't have to sell your house. You don't have to give your paycheck. But will you give something? Have you done your best? That's all we need is a heart that's willing to do the best. And have you done that? Have you done everything? I know there's still some people sitting here right now that are zero, and maybe you can't financially. Um, if you don't think you can financially, talk to Mo. Because I think Mo could help you see something a little bit different. Amen. You know, uh, maybe the truth is financially you can't give, but you know there's still 2,000, 2,000 raffle tickets to sell. That's $20,000. Do you have a heart that's willing to text somebody and say, please buy 10 tickets? If not, man, where are you? Because it's the heart. It's always about the heart. It's not about the quantity. It's not about anything other than where is your heart? Give your fish. Give your loaves. Come on. You know, I, I would appeal to the understanding of what Mo said also is that the special missions, it's not just starting the 32. The banner says 30. We've gone to 32. It's not the 32 churches. It's not like, oh, if we fall short, well, maybe we only start 20 churches this year. Praise Jesus for that. No, there are missionaries on the field now. There are evangelists on the field now in places like Haiti and the Philippines and these other mission teams that cannot support themselves. The church cannot sustain them. The special missions is what keeps them going. It's not just the new churches. We have people that were willing to give up everything to go anywhere and do anything Where is our heart to let them evangelize the world in a way that we cannot? Why is the GNN video so important? It's not just encouraging. It's a reminder that we are part of something worldwide because we can get focused in on just Orlando and just us. But we have to see the bigger picture. We need to keep it on our hearts that we're going after a lost world not just the lost in Orlando. And I'm not appealing to your money. I'm not appealing to your wallet. I'm appealing to your heart. There's a movie called The Patriot with Mel Gibson, and there's a scene from that movie where this one person stands up, and 
she asks the men, will you now, when you're needed the most, stop only at words? I ask only that you act upon the things that you say and profess to believe. And that's what I'm asking. Will you now stop only at your words? I'm appealing to your hearts. Are you present but not here? Do you have a form of godliness, but in truth your heart is far from God? Are you doing your best? Are you giving your best? When you're called to serve, to lead, to give, to go, will you stop only at your words? Now is the time, and this is the only season you have to God be the glory.